This program contains coarse language. Yes, it feels good. Okay, I'm going to go for the... The thing I love about gaming is immersing myself in a different world and just having some downtime outside of the scary realities of, you know, life. I love how you can connect with people and how you can build, you can create, you can build whatever you want and you can just connect, have fun. Millions of Australians play video games every day. The video games industry are in the business of manufacturing fun and video games are fun for many people but for a small percentage of people it can be misery. Gaming has become a global business worth around 175 billion US dollars, more than Hollywood and the music industry combined. Modern game designers, they want your time and they want your money. More money and more time. Some of these larger game development entities, some of the big players in the mobile video game space have just gone, oh my God, this is a license to print money. For some players, switching off can be a struggle. And it's not just kids. You become so immersed in the game world and what's going on that that is your world and that's your priority. I know I was manipulated by the game. I could see it was manipulating me, but I was still participating. Tonight on Four Corners, we investigate the business of video gaming. We'll examine how some games are being deliberately designed to extract maximum time and money from players. And we'll reveal the psychological tricks being used to keep gamers hooked. Chickens. Ready. Ready. The kids' homework is done and dinner is over. For the Jackson family on the outskirts of Melbourne, that means it's time to start gaming. Oh, I'm so lucky. Are you breaking all the... Yes. I think it's one thing that means a lot to me because I have so many great memories of it and it's one of those things that's... It's like a hobby, it's really important to you. And you think now if you ever stopped, your life would end because you just, you don't want to stop. Ivy is 10 years old. Her favourite game is Minecraft, one of the biggest selling games of all time. Since its release a decade ago, it's made an estimated 3 billion US dollars. You can create, you can build whatever you want and you can just connect, have fun. With enough coding skills, you can create mini games. If you can make things walk forward, screen time can affect you. You can get addictions and that can become a serious problem. But at the same time, I kind of wish, why do addictions exist? Why can't we just play? Why is looking at a screen for too long bad for you? Like, I know why, but like, why does it have to be? It's kind of weird to not see someone on a computer or playing a game. In the same way that some families go camping, we play video games. Ivy's sister, Lillian, is 15 years old. She also plays Minecraft and is trying to build up an online following of people who watch her as she games. OK, <laughs> that's one way to stream. Uh, we're going to set up another one, I guess. So I stream on the platform Twitch. It's like a live stream of your computer screen to whoever clicks on it. Like, I watch a bunch of YouTubers who also do it. Like, I, it looks like they're having fun. Why not? I like being able to connect with my friends and other different people and the gaming community is just a nice place to do that after school and on weekends. Their brother Jay is 13 and loves a game called Roblox. It's free to download but encourages players like Jay to spend real money on a virtual currency called Robux. 
Roblox Corporation was recently valued at $38 billion. This is the avatar shop where you can buy stuff for your avatar. I really want to buy is to buy it back, 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 try, but it's 50,000 Robux and I don't have that kind of money yet. And do you know how much 50,000 Robux is in like Australian dollars? Not really, but I know it's more than like a hundred dollars. And what is it about the Violet Valkyrie hat that you want? I've seen it on YouTubers that I watch and it makes the avatar look really cool. People always really want this one and I would like to have it on my avatar too. <laughs> They're trying to get kids' pocket money off them. So they come and they ask for money. And it's all of these little transactions. Oh, it's just eight bucks. It's just two bucks. It's just... And it's, it's very, very different to... You'd pay, you'd pay for the game, and then you'd pay for your subscription to get the extra stuff to all of these little microtransactions of just $2, just $2, that add up before you have any idea how much you've spent. The children's mother, Nay Jackson, has been gaming since she was a child. For years, she dedicated her life to a multiplayer fantasy game called Rift, where players join together in so-called guilds. They're teams of players from around the world. I think the ultimate kill that I made with my original guild was a giant octopus. And we spent months killing <laughs> giant animated squid. But it was amazing. And the feeling of achievement, the sense of achievement when we finally killed it, we killed it on our own. We didn't recruit any um, semi-pro players in to help us kill it. We did it ourselves. It was amazing. And just the cheer that went up when we finally got that kill and the little scroll across the bottom, achievement unlocked. Oh, it was, there's, there's nothing like it. Like it's still, there's no team building like killing a giant squid. How many hours a day were you spending on Rift killing a giant squid? So during an entire day, you could easily do eight hours on a raid day, and there would be two to three raid days per week. Nay would regularly play through the night. Getting the kids to school on time the next morning was definitely a problem. I was really tired. I was often tired and I'd fall asleep accidentally and once I missed a school pickup because I was asleep because I fell asleep being tired. Um, you know, the school would call, you know, where are you? It's only a couple of minutes down the road, so I just nipped up and got them. I remember putting my sister and brother to bed and tucking them in and everything, and then mum would come in when she got a break. And that was, that was just kind of how, I guess, I grew up from about seven. I just remember it almost always being there. <laughs> Gaming for eight hours at a stretch took a toll on Nay's health. She ended up with stress injuries to her hands. I lost a lot of muscle tone when I started gaming a lot. My shoulders would ache, my neck aches, and for quite a while I had problems with my wrists. They would actually seize up and I actually had to step out of the raiding team of the guild for a while there because my wrist was so bad I actually couldn't game, it would cramp um, and take painkillers to get through it. And yeah, what am I doing to myself for the sake of a giant rock monster or a giant squid? On one occasion, Nay organised her whole family life around a 24-hour binge. All I had to do was prep the food, organise the play dates, and I had to write all the lists down so that I was organised and I could give it 24 hours straight. I bought energy drinks, dinners were made and prepped, I knew exactly when I was going to feed them, I had people coming to pick up the kids for play dates and drop off and that kind of thing, and uh, when one of them, one of the play dates fell through, the kid went to play at the neighbours. So I had everything down to a fine art so that for that 24 hours, I did nothing but explore the new world. Were you addicted to this game? If you're prepping meals and organising schedules around a game map dropping, it's 
pretty safe to say that either you are overly fiercely competitive, which I'm not, or you're addicted and you've become so immersed in the game world and what's going on that that is your world and that's your priority. Ron Curry represents the booming Australian game development and publishing industry. In 2019, Australians spent close to $3.2 billion on gaming. About uh, three quarters of Australian play games, and that certainly goes up much higher when we start to talk about um, younger people, people in their, their teens and their 20s, that number gets up around the 90%. But interestingly, you know, the fastest growing group in that is retired women. And we certainly see them as the accelerated group of gamers. Because, you know, they have time, um, they're getting used to uh, engaging online. Players around the world can connect and compete online. It means that a game is now always underway somewhere for anyone who wants to play. No matter where you are, you have an access to a game. You can have that quick little game when you're uh, at, at the bus stop. You can go home for that really deep, engaging game um, by yourself. Or more importantly now, every time we pick up a device, we're not playing alone. And we know this, we know that gamers don't play alone anymore. They prefer to play with a friend or a whole series of friends. The video games industry are in the business of manufacturing fun. And video games are fun for many people, but for a small percentage of people, it can be misery. Dr Kim Lee is a psychiatrist who treats children and teenagers struggling with their gaming habits. As therapists, as people working with young people, we're playing catch-up and we've been playing catch-up ever since games came out. Today, he's training counsellors in Adelaide to deal with the growing number of patients they're seeing See with problem gaming. They might be saying to themselves, my online game teammates need me, I won't be able to cope, to cope unless I'm playing an online game. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing or nothing else I can do than an online game. And I'll feel better about myself if I play a game. Oh, battle! <laughs> <laughs> Low speed, moderately fast. All right, so we can pick our characters. Oh, yeah. Are you guys picking characters? I'm going to be guys swinging in the Zelda. Go. He wants the counsellors to understand the appeal of video games. Uh, so they know exactly what they're up against. The main reason why I brought in the Nintendo Switch and played Mario Kart with them is to show them how polished video games are now today. And to explore with them what they found fun about the game and how they felt whilst they were playing the game because different people play for different reasons and the best way that I could show that as an example was to get them to actually do it and hear the sights and sounds and as you can see from today, it sounded very much like a poker machine. It's like all these rings and bells and um, lots of flashing lights and it's very exciting. People got really invested into it. This is the study from the... In 2019, the World Health Organisation classified video game disorder as a behavioural addiction. And the government... And it's characterised by a loss of control over your gaming time, priority over other activities for video games, and then you get negative consequences because of the amount of time that you're spending playing video games. Psychologist Dr Daniel King led a recent review of 53 global studies, which found 2% of all players had gaming disorder. That's potentially tens of millions of people worldwide. The gaming industry often um, expresses opposition to this notion of problem gaming and gaming disorder on, this, on the basis that many people Millions of people enjoy games. They do it to socialise, they get some other personal satisfaction. But that's not, that does not invalidate the phenomenon of gaming disorder. Um, the fact that it's an activity enjoyed by millions, we could say that about many other recreational activities. We could say it about gambling. But we know that many people do have a problem with gambling and we know that many people have a problem with their gaming. Just to say there's a gaming disorder may just be a little bit too lazy. It's too easy to say they play too much, too many games, therefore they have a problem. What, we, what we're saying is we'd like to understand is there an underlying reason why people are playing too long? Sometimes it's just they play too long. 
Other times there's social issues, there's depression issues, there's other medical issues, there's other familial issues that just make them drive them to play the game as an escape from something else. Internet gaming disorder was highly associated with panic disorder, separation anxiety and depression. I'm seeing families being torn apart. As a psychiatrist, I see a lot of children who are presenting in distress, self-harming, having thoughts that life isn't worth living. I have had paediatricians refer children to me who have been soiling themselves, and the paediatricians will do all the tests, physical examination, all the you know, um, imaging, do all the investigations, and they can't find any physical cause for a young child soiling themselves, and they'll refer them to me and the child will come to my office, I'll ask them, what are you doing when you're soiling themselves? They'll tell me they're playing a video game and they can't stop. Dr Lee understands what it's like to be drawn into the world of a game. For the last five years, he's been hooked on Pokemon Go, a mobile game that's made an estimated $4 billion. It's a good way for me to just mind-numbingly escape whatever stresses I have in the day. You love getting the reward when you've reached there, but you look back and you kind of regret the amount of time that you have spent to get to that spot. And you wonder how else I could have spent my time in a more worthwhile way. Dr Lee knows how hard it can be to quit a game. And I've gone through at least two different 90-day detoxes. So my first ever self-imposed detox with the help of people using forums online, um, journaling my entries, I tried to quit Pokemon Go. And within the first week, I failed. I relapsed because the game offered me a opportunity, a reward I couldn't simply refuse. I've been waiting for this particular reward for a long time. And so I relapsed. The other reasons why I relapsed was my teammates, they kept messaging me, telling me to come back and play. The problem is, is once the flow rewards are started, how do you stop? Your personal life starts to exist in the game. So you're meeting friends in game, you're making friends in game. Yeah, it's all about, you know, running around in the games, doing adventures and killing creatures and whatever you want to do. Psychology student Rob Lemming has been gaming his entire adult life. He became hooked, losing himself for weeks in blockbuster games like World of Warcraft and Assassin's Creed. I would wake up, I would do essentially the basics, you know, borderline get dressed if I had to, um, put a bit of food in my belly, definitely make a coffee, usually a strong one, and sit down and start playing. And at that point on, everything in the day revolved around the game uh, or what I was doing. When I was deep into playing World of Warcraft, my partner threw a term around at the time which I found hilarious, but it was pretty horrifying. She said she was almost one of the widows of Warcraft, um, describing herself as one of the one of the partners of, of a couple um, <laughs> who was out in the cold while the other half was engrossed in this game. The idea of these games is to get people far more um, hooked into the game, more immersed into the game, uh, getting them to spend less time away from the game and feel much more invested in the game as they make progress through it. Rob sank into what gamers call grinding the repetitive play required to progress through some games. Like, I remember one game playing, uh, I think it might have been Assassin's Creed. One of the Assassin's Creed series, there's a lot of them. I spent days jumping around rooftops in some ancient land collecting feathers. And <laughs> I'm sitting here now and I'm going, huh? What for? They didn't, maybe they gave my character a, a new sword or something, but they didn't, the game didn't depend on it. It's not a ca Assassin's Creed fight for feathers. Round one, your turn. 
In many games, players can avoid some of the grinding by paying real money to progress more quickly. It's known as pay to win. The pay to win model is pretty much as it sounds, that two people can play and they can follow the same set of rules of progression to get better. Um, so we could both start at level one and we could keep playing the certain amount of hours and, and depending on our skill level, perhaps slightly faster than one another or you or me could just spend some money then and there and get all the advantages that come with having progressed. So games that are pay to win are games that um, are asking players to um, use, you know, spend some money to buy things that are not just cosmetics uh, in the game, just to make you look cool, just like shoes, um, the skin that you want to have in the game but you pay to have specific abilities or to have a specific weapon that's gonna give you an advantage in the gameplay. Um, so typically gamers hate that <laughs> because they want it to be fair uh, and pay to win is not very well regarded. Dr. Celia Hodent has helped design some of the biggest games in the world, including Fortnite. She uses cognitive science to understand the gamer's brain. You don't want to just think about revenues and think about profiting at the expense of players and their fun and, and their best interest. So to me, it's really an ethical consideration and the line is a bit blurry. Persuading players to pay money for advantages and extra features is now a key part of the gaming business model. These payments are known as in-game purchases or microtransactions. At their core, they are a moment within a game where a player is asked to purchase something within that game, either with uh, money directly or via the purchase of in-game currency that then allows you to purchase the item. Green Senator Jordan Steele-John is a keen gamer who has investigated in-game purchases. Now, the item may make your character look different, it may help you advance easier within the game, it might make you stronger or invisible or those kind of things, but at the heart of it, it's a moment where a player is asked to expend uh, an amount of money to gain some kind of advantage or difference within the game. Microtransactions started appearing in games in the mid-2000s and now make up three quarters of all gaming revenue. Last year, gamers around the world spent about 117 billion US dollars on microtransactions. Of the highest selling 20 console and computer games in Australia last year, 18 included some type of microtransaction. Microtransactions make up a significant part of the market in Australia. And that's because, you know, consumers have learnt um, that if they like a game, they can buy into it and quite literally buy into the game. Uh, and, you know, whether that's buying a new skin or whether that's, you know, creating, like I said before, like a new house, or you know, the vehicle you're driving, you want to change the tyres on it. Now, that's that interactivity that people are enjoying in games, that it's not this linear, you know, two-dimensional entertainment medium. It's three-dimensional and they can control a whole lot of it. So, yes, they're spending their money on it. We refer to this concept of predatory monetization, which is about the schemes within games that disguise or mislead the player about how much money they actually need to spend in the long term until they're uh, already committed into the game. So some of the systems that games that use predatory monetization um, include <clears throat> constant solicitations to, to spend money and developers want you to spend money as soon as you get into the game. They want people to uh, spend money in some way. I've always been a gamer, but I also delved into some cosplay, which stands for costume role play, and you dress up as fictional characters. And so that was another way that I expressed my, um, you know, love for gaming and pop culture in general. Laura Gilbert is a passionate gamer and streamer, playing character-driven epics like Batman. Hello there, General Kenobi. Welcome to streams. 
She's one of many gamers becoming disillusioned with how focused gaming has become on microtransactions and profits. Mattias is here, Sawilo is here, Sammy is here. There's a game that I love playing and it's actually directed at a, quite a young market, like primary school kids. And the amount of small money grabs that they try to make, you get this out, this other colour, you can be characterise this. And I, I want the cool outfit, but oh, I've got to ask mum for the credit card and then how many small transactions do you need to make? The most controversial type of microtransaction is the loot box. Some mimic the look and sound of poker machines. Others are spinning prize wheel. Yes! They're like a virtual treasure chest that a player buys with no guarantee of what they win. I think it has that element of gambling because you don't know what you're going to get in that loot box. Whereas an expansion pack, I mean, it is a better, better form of an additional cost because you know exactly what you're getting yourself into and you know what you're purchasing. Whereas a loot box is a form of gambling. And um, that's where I draw the line personally with my personal morals and values. It's used to engage people with the monetization of the game. So that's what a loot box is, and it just started to appear um, probably around 2010, something like that. Um, and because it was successful and um, game developers saw that um, players liked that and it was making revenues, um, a lot of people started to use it um, just because it works for this game, and so why not use it? Loot boxes earned games companies an estimated $15 billion last year. This slice of the global gaming market is projected to grow to $20 billion by 2025. We do know that the psychological mechanisms that many loot box systems operate on are very similar to other forms of gambling. And we do know that a disproportionate amount of the revenue that loot boxes draw come from, or comes from players that score highly in terms of problem gambling symptomology. Psychological scientist Dr James Saw analyses how video game design affects behaviour and has conducted several studies into loot boxes. We are talking here about potent psychological mechanisms and not everybody has a background in, in human motivation or human psychology, so they won't necessarily be aware of these things. Um, yes, it, it, it's possible that these mechanisms can influence players' behaviour without players being explicitly or, or consciously aware of those pools. I think we need to help gamers understand what's going on under the hood. The concern is that we are enabling particularly young people or people in vulnerable situations to come into contact with the basic mechanisms of gambling, particularly pokies, um, at very early ages and in contexts where they might not be aware that that's what, in fact, they are coming into contact with. The games industry defends loot boxes, saying they're no different to a kinder surprise. As young kids, we, you know, we love to get a lucky dip, you know, or we Pokemon cards or Kinder Surprises, and that mechanism is, is a similar mechanism to what's in loot boxes. I don't think they're similar to gambling. You know, with a loot box, you are investing money to get something back. You always get something back. Whatever you get, you can use in your game. Now, whether it's something that you really wanted to play in your game or it's something that's less than what you wanted, it's still something you can play in your game. I think loot boxes are different to a Kinder Surprise. I think when somebody buys a Kinder Surprise, by and large, they know what they're getting. They're getting some chocolate and they're getting a little plastic toy. In loot boxes, you buy a game and there's a reward mechanism in the game. You don't buy the game for the reward mechanism, but the re reward mechanism's there. You purchase, um, you, you know, you purchase access to this reward mechanism and you get a random outcome that might be very valuable or might be not, a, not at all valuable. 
was the Senate in 2018, Jordan Steele John led a parliamentary inquiry into the potential harm of loot boxes. Well, we gathered really great evidence during the course of that Senate inquiry uh, from community, from academic experts, from people particularly within the uh, kind of uh, independent development space within the video game industry here in Australia. Um, and it was pretty compelling and quite clear uh, that these uh, loot boxes, uh, particularly when they meet the psychological definition um, of gambling, um, pose a real risk to kids uh, and to vulnerable people. Um, and that there were some really clear steps that could be taken um, to, to support the community to know exactly what they were, were playing and buying into. The inquiry acknowledged widespread concern that loot boxes could normalise gambling and cause harm. But after lobbying from big players in the games industry, the only recommendation was for the federal government to conduct another review into loot boxes. I believe that the major parties rejected stronger recommendations because of the influence upon them uh, by the gambling industry in Australia. I mean, ultimately, what we heard uh, from the community and from academic experts, people that work in the video game industry, is that at the heart of the loot box exists the same mechanisms uh, that exist at the heart of the poker machine, and that those mechanisms are predatory that they exist to trigger addiction and compulsive, continual use. Senator Jordan Steele John told us that loot boxes were, and I'm quoting him, akin to putting a child in front of a poker machine. Do you agree with his assessment? No, I don't. And I've, and I've had this conversation directly with him. And I actually had this conversation with him um, at the Senate inquiry that he called into, into loot boxes, which, which we were, had a very big part in. That inquiry came out and and said that, first off, there are different styles of loot boxes, so they, they're not all the same. And secondly, that the government would continue to monitor it. But at the, at the time of the inquiry, didn't believe that there was a big enough issue or that there actually was uh, a link between gambling and loot boxes. Countries like Belgium have banned loot boxes outright. Uh, China has required odds disclosures, so companies, gaming companies, have to be open with players about, well, these are the odds of getting this valuable type of reward or this other. Um, other countries are focusing on consumer awareness campaigns and consumer information, but as yet I've, I've not heard of Australia's intent to regulate. Hello. I'm here to talk about monetization. It's let's go whaling. The psychological techniques some games companies can use to suck cash from players are rarely acknowledged by the industry. Uh, hook habit hobby. This is a... Mobile gaming executive Turolf Jönström shocked many by openly discussing these techniques at a conference in Helsinki. The first spend is, uh, it breaks the ice, then they think of themselves as spenders in the game. It's okay for me to spend in the game. Uh, lots of people are otherwise have this wall up, I will never pay for a mobile game. So you need to break the, the wall first. A summary of a huge bunch of uh, behavioural psychology. So the, the tricks on, on how to monetize a game well. Some of you will probably uh, be slightly shocked by all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. We can discuss it uh, if we have time later. He doesn't give a fuck. That's basically what he's trying to say. Gamers responded angrily when they saw the talk posted online. Let's just talk. Yeah, all right, all right. Let's get on with the show. So let's go down into some of, of these tr more tricks. Watching on in utter disbelief as the game industry proudly boasts and gloats about the ways in which it psychologically hooks people into unethical, unnecessary, aggressive video game monetization. The 5% that actually do play it, they will spend a lot. I love this medium too much to let shit like this be normalized. You can have a game where you just progress by grinding or you can pay. Someone in the game industry discussing monetization, it's a very sensitive subject. If you work in a big company, I don't think they'll let you do it. So the only reason I, I, I could do it is, is was because I, I uh, with, with a friend of mine, uh, we had our own company and um, there was no one telling us what, what we can and cannot do. 
we need like 200 against 100 loss. Terrell Fjernström says players need to know the reality of the industry's business model. If you are going all in for making as much money as possible on them, that I do do think is is uh, dishonest and unhealthy. And uh, uh, I hope that that the players would realize that and uh, move away from such games, and also that that the uh, platform operators, the the app stores, are are basically cracking down on such behavior. With the rise of artificial intelligence and data collection, games developers are getting even better at exploiting players. Many of these games are using machine learning. They're tracking what players are doing, using people's information and the information contained within their social network to make um, very strong predictions about how people will behave within the context of the game. So I think we're already at a point where the games have become extremely sophisticated and in some ways um, players are not always aware of how much the, the, the game is actually playing them. COVID-19 has delivered a windfall to the games industry with people around the world trapped at home. So March 2020, we were entering into lockdown and so I was actually just looking for something to occupy myself from home. Big days at home with the kids and so once the kids went to sleep, I wanted to find something to play around with or something that would engage me. Kat McDonald was sucked in by the Chinese-made mobile phone strategy game Legend of the Phoenix. In March, the game made a reported $2 million just through microtransactions. When I was playing the game in the earlier days and I was paying money to be part of the um, and I'd find myself in one of the top ranks or winning a round. I think I won one round. And so it just felt really good to be at the top of something because, you know, at that time in my life, I probably wasn't feeling like I was succeeding. I was getting a lot of negative kind of vibes and things like that. And COVID was a really sad time for a lot of people. So um, I went for... Uh, it felt nice to actually be succeeding in something. <laughs> Kat was recruited into an online team or guild through the in-game messaging system. Guilds can increase the pressure on gamers to keep playing and spending. I was definitely identified by the guild because of my regular gameplay and the fact that I had increased so much power and that was by spending money. So there was a bit of a community sense and an obligation almost that she had to maintain and help and support her guild pushing forward. And it was around that time that she spent a lot more time and I'm assuming a bit more money um, doing that. Kat bought the in-game currency to spend on outfits and to boost her character's power. The more she spent in Legend of the Phoenix, the further she advanced. The intent behind an in-game currency is to change the psychological value of money that's being spent on the game. And game developers will sometimes use multiple currencies to um, make it difficult for players to keep track of how much they're spending. Kat was so immersed in the game, she lost track of exactly how much she'd spent. I had thought that it was around the $2,500 mark and it just took a little bit of digging because I wasn't sure how to work out an itemised account because on your bank account it just says Apple, so it could be Stan or your Netflix subscriptions or whatever. So once I finally found out how to do the itemised Apple account, I sat down with a notepad and pen and wrote out every single transaction and added it up to $4,000 and that was just... Every time I kept adding it more, I'm like, it can't be that much, it can't be that much, but it was, and it was really mind-blowing. How did you feel when you came to that final figure? I felt a little bit sick. I felt a bit scared to tell my husband um, because 
we share funds in our house. So I felt like that was money that the family could have spent. And I hadn't even noticed that I'd spent any of that, uh, anywhere near that much. And I went, wow. Because she'd been playing it for a long time. Um, and the fact that she'd only just realised how much she'd spent on the game, I, I wasn't angry, but it, it kind of hit me and went, wow. If she hadn't been checking that, could you imagine how much more she could have spent? Hey, Lewis, can you put some yellow on this? I know I was manipulated by the game. I could see it was manipulating me, but I was still participating because it was still giving me that dopamine rush when you're like, oh, I got all this free stuff, or you find yourself in the top 10 of the ranking and you're like, well, that was money well spent. It's not really. It's my paper. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Modern game designers, they want your time and they want your money. More money and more time. So the more time they get from you, the more money they're going to get from you, and the bigger their back end is going to be. There are adults who spend too much on video games, as there are adults who spend too much on a whole lot of other activities. So what is being done to protect those people? There are warnings throughout the game which will actually trigger a warning that's, that's saying, you know, you have spent too much money or you are spending too much, are you sure you want to spend this? Um, outside of that, there's, there's not a lot of uh, protection. So we've spoken with a woman who spent over $4,000 on the game and was horrified to realise that she had spent that much. She says there were no triggers, there were no warnings. Yeah, and again, it's hard to say, you know, if we take one instance of someone spending $4,000, which, which is a lot of money, although there are people who would spend $4,000 happily over a year which for, on a video game, which, which they budget for and that's part of their entertainment budget. Um, but with the array of games and publishers and, and different actors within this, within this market, there'll always be those who, who aren't probably as upfront as they should be. The game developer knows much more about the player than the player knows about the game. And we call that an information asymmetry. In the early days, games, players would go through them and learn more about the game and the system and become more um, practised. They could apply skill and strategy to effectively get better and master the game. These sorts of games, mobile games, games that use predatory monetization, have kind of flipped the equation. Video gaming has grown into one of the most lucrative entertainment businesses in the world. It's succeeded through a combination of immense popular appeal and a business model deliberately designed to get people hooked. Gamers are now starting to realise how they've been played. Nowadays, gamers themselves are actually saying, hang on a sec, these games are getting more and more advanced. The online interactivity, the way it's programmed, there's something wrong with the way it's programmed. And they, they're, not, they're not stupid, they're not silly. They realise that the gaming companies are trying to sell them a product and use their psychology against them. Oh, Batman parkour! I have fears for, not myself, but for other people. I also have fears about greed because that's where it all stems from, is the greed to make money, because they're really sacrificing someone else's life, essentially. Like with any gambling, people, you know, gamble away their lives and gaming, um, you know, they'll game away their lives. Gaming is escapism and gaming is an experience that is supposed to be fun and engaging or scary if you're into horror and that sort of thing. It isn't something to make thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, billions of dollars off people who aren't really able to stop. 